Welcome to the Lizzie Borden Podcast, Episode 16. I am your host, Stephanie Corey, filling in for the late Richard Behrens, author of the Lizzie Borden Girl Detective series of mysteries. The Lizzie Borden Podcast is the only podcast entirely devoted to the study of the Borden murders of 1892, Lizzie Borden, and sometimes the history of her hometown, Fall River, Massachusetts. Produced by Nine Muses Books and Anna Behrens. Each episode explores some aspect of the mystery that is Lizzie Borden, from the origins of the doggerel, Lizzie Borden took an axe, to the primer on the case by noted authors and experts, including dramatic readings of Richard Barron's Lizzie Borden Girl Detective Mystery Series. In this episode, we interview William Spencer, author of two books on the case. His first one, The Case Against Lizzie Borden, examines the legal proceedings, inquest, preliminary hearing, grand jury, and trial on a daily basis. Bill's newest book is titled Lizzie Borden Uncut, A Case Book of Theories. It is the book that every Bordenite wished someone would write. It's a critique of all the major books and legal articles on the Borden murders and covers five main areas, the books and essays about the legal aspects, those authors who believe an intruder did it, those authors who rely on conspiracy for their solution, those who believe Lizzie did it, and those who write that Bridget Sullivan was the killer. Only after all of this does Bill examine motive and means and gives his take on the crimes. It's an excellent read and highly recommended. And now, the Lizzie Borden Podcast presents an interview with William Spencer. Hello, we're here today with Bill Spencer, the author of two, count them, two Lizzie Borden books. The first book came out in COVID, unfortunately. Didn't get a lot of press at the time, but it should have. It's called The Case Against Lizzie Borden and covers the legal aspects of the Lizzie Borden case. The second book, which is just out just now, and you can get it hot off the presses, is called Lizzie Borden Uncut, A Case Book of Theories. And as the title suggests, it is a collection of other authors' theories of the Lizzie Borden case. It's the book that every Lizzie Borden scholar wanted somebody to write. And Bill Spencer wrote that book. Hi, Bill. How are you today, Stephanie? Oh, it's hot. It is hot. I'm, I'm from North Carolina, not originally, but I live there now. And I thought I was going to get cool when I came up here, but it hasn't worked out that way. Well, remember, it's August 4th. All right. so. Well, it is August 4th. And uh, it's hotter, I think, now than it was then. Well, that could be. There's a lot of uh, skepticism about what, what the temperature actually was on the, on the August 4th um, of the murders. So what got you interested in Lizzie Borden generally? I've always liked true crime. I like um, American history, especially late 19th century American history. And one day, in, I guess 1980s, I was in the library. I happened to come across a Lizzie Borden book and uh, read it thought it was interesting. Nothing much else happened until about 15 years later, I happened to buy another Lizzie Borden book at a used book sale. It got me interested in the case again. And about that time, uh, you had put out, I believe about that time, you had put out the trial testimony and, and some other information, and I started reading that. And when I compared the trial testimony and, and other testimonies to what I had read about, uh, the previous the other authors didn't make any sense to me so then i started to investigate it even more and i went over all the legal background that i could uh, and eventually got inspired to write a book about it why the legal aspects of it uh i, I like to put, uh, approach the case from the ground up I, i'd like to look at the evidence and see where that leads me not go backwards and try to decide first who did it and then go back and and see if i can make it fit so you started with what, witness statements or? Uh, I don't know which, I think I read the preliminary hearing last, but I believe, I, I think I started with the witness statements and I think I read the trial then. So, so the book, the first book examines the legal days, day by day, her legal ordeal, right. which I call an ordeal, right. okay? So the first book is the inquest, every day of the inquest. 
Uh, well, the first book starts just before the murders. Mm -hmm. Well, there's some background information, but it starts just a, a, a day or two before the murders and goes to the end of the trial. So it's full of factual information. Yes, it's all factual. And the newspapers. I mentioned newspapers, but I don't use newspapers as, as reliable sources, especially of, of the time. Good um, for you. They, they have uh, editorial bents. They have uh, deadlines to meet. And there's all kinds of articles in the local papers and even the national papers that have incorrect information in them. And, and the other thing that happens is when one newspaper writes it, a lot of the other times, a lot of times the other newspapers pick it up. And so they just repeat that same mistake and it keeps going much like today a lot like today yeah without without the uh, and i'm not the, the i don't mean television. newspapers i mean right. books right books do that they pick up the one thing that's the most purient kind of information that they can think of and then they repeat it again and again and again well when i was doing the second book i noticed i didn't figure it out right away but i noticed that a certain misfact would be stated over and over again and and then and exaggerated upon, too. Well, right, and that, that's where it starts. But then when I went back, I noticed that an early author had made a statement. And if that statement fit a later author's purpose, he used it as a fact. So the, the first statement that was made was a misfact, and that misfact kept, kept going in other books. Well, a lot of people read about Lizzie Borden, but not everybody starts to write a book about it. So what made you think that, hey... I want to write about this. Uh, pent up um, <laughs> demand inside of me, I guess. Uh, so, as an aside, it has nothing to do with this particular book. It's that uh, sooner or later we're all going to be gone. And I used to go into a library or a bookstore or a book sale, and I'd see 10,000 books, and I'd say, and I can't write one? So I was looking for something to write a book about, and it just oh, fell into place. That's interesting. Yeah. It's kind of like people who see, go to an art museum and right. say, I can paint that. Right. And sometimes they turn out to be good artists. Sometimes. Yeah, yeah. it's true. Well, the first book, the Lizzie Borden, um, the case against Lizzie Borden, it's a perfect title because it is about all the case is against her because she's the defendant. So you're looking at all these primary source materials, right? Right. As opposed to secondary sources, which would be newspapers or gossip, gossip or right. uh, diaries even could be secondhand information. So you write this book and during COVID. Well, I actually finished the book January, I think it was January of 2020. Right. Yeah. And so it was unfortunate that we couldn't get a book signing on it and right. get a lot of publicity on it. It's really valuable piece of research. I think it's the most important examination of the case. Not the crime, right. but the case, which is completely different to me. Is it, is it different for well, you? Well, the, the difference between my book and the other ones that I critique is I don't have an agenda. I'm not trying to prove anybody's guilty. I have an opinion, but I don't try to impose that on anybody. I just want to state the facts. You, I do have an opinion on who did it, if you want to agree with that, it's fine. If you want to disagree with it, it's fine. But if, whether you agree with it or disagree with it, you can use the first book to find out what the facts of the case are. Do you think a lot of people don't? Oh, I think most people don't. <laughs> um, a lot of people will... I, I, I'm not a psychologist. It, I, it's like they want to believe something complicated that could be very simple uh, because it's intriguing. Or... Sexy. Or sexy or whatever, yeah. Yeah. And Lots of times the truth isn't isn't sexy, as you said. It, uh, so a conspiracy about a murder is more interesting than a cut-and-dry murder case. So it's less, it's, uh, people are, are avoid the mundane. They, yes, they do. Well, some people do. Luckily, I like the mundane, so <laughs> let me write a book about it. So, but it's not really mundane, because <laughs> this is a Lizzie Borden case that'll never be solved. <laughs> well, by mundane, I mean... Uh, the trial is like, I think, 1,800 pages. Yeah. I couldn't get enough of it. Now, how many people want to read an 1,800-page trial transcript? Probably not a lot, but I loved it. Well, I'm glad you liked yeah. it. It was, a, it was a chore putting that right, together. I'm sure it was. Yeah. Getting that transcribed uh, was a, a story in and of itself. And all of those things are available for free for you to read. So there you go. So it's out there for other people to also get on the same page as you with the facts of the case, right? 
The interesting thing about Lizzie Borden, not that I'm an expert in this, but... Yeah, you are. But, but well, O.J. Simpson, perhaps, aside, I don't think there's any other case that has the background material available that this case does. In other words, um, I've never seen a preliminary hearing of the Hauptman trial. There would have been one, but I never saw it. Uh, so Lizzie Borden material oh. is readily available. All the legal procedures are readily available for us to review. Now, without those, any argument you make about the case does go back to the newspapers and gossip, and that's fairly useless in my opinion. Well, the first big book on the case was by a newspaper reporter. Right. So he had access because he was there. He was alive. He was a reporter for the for the Fall River Globe. Right. Right. Edwin Porter. And yet he gets it wrong. So how can somebody who's there not get it right? So Porter was the crime reporter for the, the Globe. He'd only been employed by them a short time. Um, he There was a call that was made to the police when the murders were discovered. And one of them went to the Fall River Globe. And I'm sure that's why he showed up at the house. And he showed up at the house within 15 or 20 minutes of the, the police arriving. He, uh, the Globe articles, and, and as far as I could tell, the articles of the other two daily papers were not, uh, did not have bylines. So you could not tell who wrote them. So I don't know which Globe articles he wrote, but he, for whatever reason, whether it was he was fascinated with the case or whether he saw an occasion to make money, he decided to keep track of the case each day. Uh, there are a lot of misconceptions about the book. Uh, the first thing is that although he claims at the beginning to cover the case entirely, he leaves big gaps in a lot of the testimony. He clearly wasn't in the courtroom on some days. Um, and that is, that's bad because you have a lot of important testimony that's not included in his book. Uh, the second is that uh, he was certain that, that Lizzie Borden was the murderer. I don't know what his personal opinion was, but he never states anything at all about the case as far as an opinion. Nothing at all. Nothing about any of the testimony, about who's guilty or anything else. Is it a, is it a circumstance where the book was rushed to press without uh, him being able to go back over it and add the stuff that his paper covered that he wasn't there for? No, that can't be the case because, first of all, I don't know when he got the idea to write the book. You could make that argument if he didn't decide until the trial was over and then went back and wrote the book. But that wasn't the case because the book came out after the trial. It came out in 1893. I'm not sure what, what month, but the trial ended on June 20th. So it was after June 20th. However, there was a letter that Lizzie Borden's lawyer wrote to him in, I believe, February of, before the trial telling him, I hear you're writing a book and I don't want you to put the pictures of any of the... Uh, of certain people and they didn't want Lizzie Borden's picture, Emma Borden's picture, and so on in the book, or there would be ramifications. So clearly, at least there was a rumor that he was writing a book in February. So there's, there was no rush to get the book out. I don't know why it was so sloppily written. That's odd. That's really yeah. odd. Because he's not, when he died, all the, all the information, all the quotes from people about him was that he was such a good guy. There were quotes about him. He, he had a a uh, very varied um, background. He had actually run a newspaper for a short time when he was young. He'd worked in some big city newspapers. He came to Fall River as uh, the editor, I believe he was the editor, uh, or at least eventually was the editor of a fledgling newspaper, but the newspaper failed within a few months, and that's when he went to work for the Globe. So he dies not too long after the end of this, the turn of the century, right? I don't know if this has anything to do with him writing a book, but he was married and he had at least one child. I believe he had, I'm pretty sure he had two children. He died of tuberculosis in the early 1900s. That's a long time before 1892, but a lot of people were sick with tuberculosis for a long time. So I don't know if he was ill uh, and wanted to write something to make some money for his family. I don't know if that had anything to do with it or not, but it's possible. That's a that's quite a collectible book to own, actually, isn't it? Uh, I, I guess there are, I, I don't know that there's too many original copies. There's a False statement that Lizzie Borden bought all the books uh, upon public, or, or her lawyers, bought all the books upon publication. And um, that's not true. Um, when Porter died, his obituary, several papers wrote an obituary form and from various parts of the country, and they all mentioned the book. And this, now this is 15 or 16 years after 
I think he died two, maybe 12 years after the, the case. This was his only book, though, right? And it was his only book, and it was 12 years after the trial, and they all said that Porter wrote a book that's going to be considered a classic, and they would quote parts of the book, so clearly the book was out in the public. However, one thing that be kept in mind is that the newspapers, even the, even the big Eastern newspapers like the New York Papers and the Boston Globe, had day-by-day -day coverage of the Borden case from the time it started, except for the Times when she was in jail, there was nothing going on. But during the preliminary hearing and the trial, they were all day-by-day -day accounts. The Porter book doesn't have anything in there that you couldn't read in the newspaper. So it's possible that there was some you know, Borden interest fade by the time the book came out. I, so I don't know how many copies he sold. Well, price varies, but a, an original Porter in pretty good condition will run about $750. Okay, but consider the fact the book was printed, I'm assuming you only had one printing. It was printed in 1892. There aren't a whole lot of 1892 1893, books. 1893, right? Or 1893, after, actually. Yeah. Um, after yes, the trial. After the trial, right, 1893. Yeah. So how many other 1893 first uh, new books did, are there around? I mean, in general, It was a book a that was read. That's right. the thing. So it would fall apart. Right. It could fall apart. Um, it was passed around and that kind of thing. But I'm with you about the legend of right. Lizzie buying them all up. And in fact, I think it's Spearing who goes hog wild with that theory and claims that there were only two copies left in existence and she had them all burned and, and destroyed. And it's absolutely not true. And right. a lot, Well, a lot of the writers that, who think that Lizzie's innocent like to say that that's an example of how the press and others were biased against Lizzie. And again, he never once says anything at all about Lizzie's innocence or and yet, anybody's innocence. And yet that's what we think right. is the truth because everybody else says it. Right. That's crazy. So, and it was the only book available until Pearson started writing in the 1920s. I think he's been referred to as the father of modern true crime mm -hmm. writing because he wrote so many different books and so many different shorter pieces within the books of various murders that happened. He seems to have been obsessed with the Lizzie Borden case in a way, emotionally. He was alive when she was alive. Right. I think he tells the story of going to her, walking by her house while she was alive and wanting her to come to the window, just imagining what was going on inside the house. But he never did meet her, but he came to Fall River. Right. So he had a sort of obsession with the case. And he wrote a, several articles and a whole book, The Trial of Lizzie Borden, which is considered quite a, a classic, but still he doesn't cover it all, does he? So the trial of Lizzie trial. Borden, like, like it says, uh, is about the trial. Now, there, there are some preliminaries in the book, but basically it's about the trial. Um, and he thinks Lizzie Borden is guilty. A later author, uh, actually more than one later author, thought that he was biased in what he put in the book. In other words, the trial has testimony that incriminates Lizzie Borden in trial that um, would indicate she wasn't guilty. And some authors claim that Pearson tends to stress the one, the, the parts where Lizzie looks like guilty. That's interesting. Yeah. He's a, was a librarian. He was a librarian. Yeah. But he was also a writer. Right. So he worked for the New York Public Library. Right. He had an interesting correspondence, didn't he, with the son of Knowlton, was it? Frank Knowlton um, went to school with him in Harvard, I think, Harvard. Yes, Harvard, yes. Um, they were, uh, what would you call them, they knew each other, but they weren't really friends. And years later, Pearson wrote to him and said, maybe you remember me. Uh, and then they started to correspond. Oh, that's right. The, uh, the Knowlton Pearson correspondence, right. which is about so, that. Uh, Frank Knowlton was the son of Hosea Knowlton, who was the DA at the Borden trial. And that's why he, uh, so he was going to Frank Knowlton to get his informa whatever information he would have had on, the, on the, the, the case. Frank didn't know a whole lot. Frank but. didn't know anything. <laughs> so um, Hosea Knowlton died not that long after the Borden case. I think it was about 1901 or two. He stepped off a streetcar, slipped, fell and hit his head, got up and said, I'm fine. And a few days later, he was dead. So, uh, I don't know that I don't know that I don't know that Knowlton discussed the case with his family or not. So, but Frank Knowlton didn't seem to know much about it. it it's it's true. Lawyers tend right. to not discuss the cases with their families. Well, and, and and they shouldn't. The other lawyers in the case minded their own business and kept to themselves. So that left authors to explore fanciful 
fanciful, I would say, conspiracy theories sometimes. Right. So the authors that you discuss, they run into, did you say four categories? Right. So there's the conspiracy theorists, there's the Lizzie did it, right. there's the intruder theory, right. and then there's the other, which is Bridget. Bridget Sullivan, right. Right. So do any of them, are any of them better than any of the others? Well, the one that, um, although I, I should say that when I critique these, I'm looking at their opinions based on actual testimonies and trial and so on. Right, you're comparing them to the truth. Right, so it's not it's not like, I don't agree with him, so therefore he's wrong. It's right. like, he says this, and I can show you the trial testimony that says that's not the case. Sullivan, who, was, who thought Lizzie was guilty, was actually a judge, and he was a judge in Fall River for a while. He wrote the book in 61. So he has some familiarity with the and city. And this is and Goodbye Lizzie Borden. Good book, Goodbye Lizzie Borden. And there's some other legal writers in 1893 and every one of the legal writers thinks Lizzie Borden is guilty. Wigmore and Davis. <clears throat> right. And they both think Lizzie was guilty. And, well, I mean, I'm not sure they state it outright, but you can tell from the tone. Well, they were more right. critical of right. the way the judge was handling right. Right. the admissibility right. of evidence and the charge to the jury. All of them, all three of them think, uh, as you know, there was there were two kinds of trial testimony, uh, two parts of the trial testimony that weren't, well, two parts that weren't allowed as trial, trial testimony, and that was the prussic acid um, purchase testimony was not allowed, and the reading of the inquest testimony was not allowed. All three of them who were of the legal persuasion uh, thought those should have, both of those should have been allowed. But the inquest testimony was allowed at the preliminary. Right, but the preliminary, uh, of course, is a much looser... Uh, it's just a judge, isn't it? Right, and it's just a judge. Uh, I will say that I believe all of them, if I'm remembering correctly, all of them felt that Lizzie should have been convicted even with those things admitted. But there was an, that, the, that the prosecution, basically what they said is the prosecution made a, a valid case and they stated a valid case and they proved it. However, the, uh, the defense uh, did not answer directly their, the charges made by the prosecution. Therefore, the prosecution should have, should have prevailed at the trial. So why didn't the prussic acid testimony, why wasn't it admitted into evidence? I don't recall if the justice said exactly why. No, you know, as a matter of fact, they don't now that you think right. about it. They made their arguments right. for and against, right. and then they called a break, right. and then they came back, and then they ruled, but they didn't say why, right. and it, the trial just went on. Right. Uh, I think Knowlton in the Knowlton papers, if I'm not mistaken, knew the trial was lost to him when those two things happened. Right. When he couldn't get in the prussic acid testimony and he couldn't get in the inquest. And I think inquest was first. And by the time the prussic acid came, he had given up. Now, the inquest testimony, they did say why. And the, yes. the charge made by the defense was uh, there was a there was an arrest warrant written out for Lizzie before the inquest, but it was not served. And after the inquest, Lizzie was arrested, but with a new warrant. The argument of the defense was that Lizzie was not a voluntary witness. She was a suspect since she was essentially under arrest by the, well, the warrant was issued before the inquest and the justice agreed with that. The legal scholars in these books do not agree with that uh, uh, finding by the justice. Isn't it also the case that she wasn't represented by her lawyer at the inquest? No, in, at that time, the inquest, the lawyer was not allowed. Well, I suppose they could have allowed it, but they did not have to allow a, a lawyer to um, to be at an inquest. Now, that law changed in Massachusetts after the Edward Kennedy uh, Chappaquiddick incident. And, after, and of course, when that happened, the Kennedys had so much money, they were able to influence the legislature enough to change it so that he was allowed to have a lawyer at the inquest. I see. Well, that's interesting. That's really but that's, what, 80 years later or whatever it was. Well, that's the way justice works, right. isn't it? Mm -hmm. So. Oh, and the other thing was that it was up to, I guess, the prosecution whether it, it didn't have to be secret, but the prosecutors could keep it secret if they wanted to, and they did keep it secret. In this so, case. but how do we know so much about the inquest, and how do we have it if it was secret? Well, it was only secret at the time. So it wasn't reported in the papers? No, it wasn't reported in the papers. 
apparently, I don't know the legal part of it, but apparently after the case, uh, the trial, I guess then they could release it. I see. Yeah. So then the grand jury meets. After, after, the, after, pre the, after preliminary. the preliminary hearing, right? And that's a secret event, right? Uh, grand juries are always secret, yes, even to this because day. Because it's only the prosecution that presents its right. case. Right, right. It's the classic ham sandwich. Or, you know, you can get anybody. But actually, they had a bad ham sandwich in this case because they were having a problem, clearly having a problem getting uh, an indictment from the grand jury. And on the Sunday morning after the murders, uh, one of Lizzie's friends, Alice Russell, was staying there. Alice Russell and Lizzie's sister, Emma, saw Lizzie rip up an old blue dress. And they didn't see her throw it in the fire, but clearly that's what Lizzie did. Uh, the next day, um, uh, the Bordens had hired a private detective named Hanscom. And I guess he asked Alice if all the dresses were still in the house that were there on the day of the murder. And she said, no, Lizzie, has, Lizzie burnt one of the dresses. Now, Hanscom of course, worked for the board, and so he didn't say anything to anybody. But so it went through the inquest, and it went through the preliminary hearing, and of course, nobody asked Lizzie, well, Lizzie Borden didn't testify at the preliminary hearing, but at the inquest, nobody asked Lizzie Borden, did you burn a dress? Because they had no clue that she burned a dress. So at some point when the grand jury was deliberating, this was at the end of November, uh, I, I suppose what happened was that Emma had a guilty conscience because suddenly... She tells Knowlton, either, either she or some lawyer that she has been seeing, tells Knowlton about this dress. He goes back and tells the grand jury, and within a day, he had an indictment. What's the weird thing you found about uh, Jennings actually being allowed to testify at the grand jury? Well, so I found out I was, I was apparently wrong about this. Um, I've, I've been on a grand jury, and, I'm, and oh. I probably heard... I was on a grand jury, and, it, 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 and I... I'm guessing this is fairly normal. It was a long time ago, but it was the grand jury was called for a one month period. And it looks like it was the same in Fall River at the time. And you don't meet every day. So you meet about twice a week and they present all day a whole bunch of cases. And most of them are pretty, they're usually like drunken driving, this drugs and things like that. I heard every assistant district attorney and one district attorney present cases, not one defense lawyer was allowed in there in the whole month. So I'm sure that's the norm. You mentioned about Knowlton uh, thinking the case was lost in the trial, but he actually was very skeptical, skeptical he could win the case much earlier than that. So I'm thinking that either to cover himself or whatever, he decided to agree with this. But several of the authors claimed that Jennings was allowed to present the grand jury, and I said, but these people got to be crazy. So while I'm, I can't remember where I came across it, but a grand juror, uh, reported that Jennings was allowed to present his case at the grand jury. This was after the after the fact. Right, right. He was he, the grand juror claimed that Jennings was allowed to make his case. So I don't think if the grand juror is being truthful, that did happen. Well, so that's a whole nother extra weird thing right. about this case, right? Because it does just doesn't happen. Well, my theory is this, and I've, I, you know, I, it's just a theory. Knowlton, I think, really believed Lizzie did it, but. He didn't have any hard evidence against her. So we have to remember that Knowlton was a politician as well as he was a lawyer. You know, he eventually became uh, the district attorney for the state. He had, he had gone through and gotten Lizzie found probably guilty at the preliminary hearing. It wouldn't have looked good if he dropped the case after that. She was found probably guilty. So how can he, say, how can he let her go and save face? So I'm wondering if he allowed Jennings to present... And if the grand jury then said no bill. Oh, I see. Yeah. He did his job. Got it. Right. No, I'm saying that happened. I'm saying no, that. No, but that, that makes total right. sense. Yeah. That makes total sense. Right. Huh. That puts a different spin on things, doesn't it? Right. Well, we know that he was sort of, it was foisted upon him. Right. So in those days, uh, I, I don't know if it's still true, probably not. But uh, in those days, the district attorney of the state had to try capital cases. Is that the, like the attorney general? The attorney general, right. Okay. I, I don't know what I said, but attorney general is what I meant. Um, and it was tried before a three-man a triumvirate of justices. Before that, not long before that, capital cases were tried by the Supreme Court in, in Massachusetts. Okay. This was a fairly recent change. The difference is the Supreme Court didn't try by jury. 
but I, I don't know if it was a public groundswell or whatever, they wanted a trial by jury. So it came down to the Superior Court. Still three judges. Well, the, I guess, I, I believe when it went to Superior Court, that's when the three judge thing started right away. The district, excuse me, the Attorney General was supposed to try the case. Well, this case was a real hot potato. It was almost a no win because if you lose the case, it looks like you went after an innocent woman. If you win the case, she could have been hanged and maybe she's innocent. And even if she is guilty, a lot of people didn't think she was guilty. So it was almost no win. So Knowlton, of course, after the grand jury, he assumes that Pillsbury's going to try, try the case. The district attorney. The district attorney. I mean, the attorney general. Right. And as you know, there are letters back and forth of them uh, you know, going back and forth. Pillsbury's like, oh, I'm too yeah. sick. So I've never found details on this, but Pillsbury claims to be ill. He's going, oh, my doctor won't let me do this. Now, this starts about January. And they're going back and forth. And, and it, it's almost humorous to, to read it because each one is trying to, to convince the other one that they've got to do the case. And I think it was roughly April before Milton just gave up and said, okay, I guess, well, I got, or if Pillsbury just said, I'm not going to do it. But an interesting sidebar of this is the Borden case, of course, would have taken some preparation and it lasted a little over two weeks. Almost immediately after the Borden case, Pillsbury decided he was fine. He's going to run for governor. So he ran for governor that year, which one would assume would have taken a lot of energy. And he had plenty of energy to do that, although he lost, I believe. He lost everything, yeah. didn't he? Right. Knowlton was a experienced prosecutor, though, so he knew right. this wasn't his first murder. No, trial. he had done many murder trials. So he knew what he was looking at when he looked at evidence, and right. he knew that he needed to get the prussic acid in, and he had to get the inquest in, right? Because Lizzie appears so self-incriminating right. in that in that, and it's interesting to me that the day that the ruling came down, that the inquest testimony was not allowed at the trial was the day that the New Bedford Evening Standard printed the inquest testimony in full. But turns out the New Bedford paper, uh, the editor, I think his name was Cooper Gaw, he got it from the district attorney's office. So it was released in protest by the district attorney's office even though it had been printed previously in the Boston Globe. It was printed in the Boston Globe um, during... Uh, the preliminary. Right. But, well, so at the preliminary hearing, the inquest was, was secret, but at the preliminary hearing, it's no longer considered secret. But not a lot of people follow preliminary right. hearings. So, yeah. so it was allowed to be read at the preliminary hearing, and the Boston Globe reporter was in the courtroom and took it down. Well, I mean, they must have had a stenographer. Took it down. It was printed in the Boston Globe in August. Yeah, but even uh, uh, Pearson didn't know that, right? Uh, well, I, I think the reason is we have to remember there's no internet, so he doesn't know what's printed in the Boston Globe necessarily. Right, you can't look it up. Right, and you can't look it up unless somebody happens to tell you that. Right. So we, I, you can't be critical of, of, of people, authors of that age, not knowing all these things, and, and, and that, that would be unfair. So I, I don't I criticize him for that. I criticize him for st misstating things. But to have the thing released sort of out of spite right so that the at least the general public knows because they read it in the newspaper locally now boston's the boston globe right. now we're talking new bedford which is much closer to fall river so you've got the new bedford standard printing the inquest testimony the day after they had it typeset and ready to go right. so the public could read not the jury who was sequestered could read this information and I wonder if that swayed anybody. I did, we won't know. Right. There's no way to know. But it's interesting how the press played a part in the story. And years after, not every year, but years after, the, new, the uh, Fall River Globe would run these anniversary issues on the murder and kind of throw it up into Lizzie's face. Right. And she ignored it by leaving town. And she would go away for August right. during that period of time and go to Washington, D.C. or someplace else just to get her out of the, it was always mem remembered. It was right. always remembered in the city. Oh, one thing I did remember, um, you, you would ask about the prussic acid. The reason, I don't know that it was stated, but it appears that the reason it wasn't allowed is through some very convoluted 
questioning by, well, I, the, ju the judge was involved, the justice was involved somehow, but what, what basically happened was the prosecution is still presenting its case, and he's, he's going to call Eli Betts, who was the, one of the druggists that recognized Lizzie Borden in the drugstore. So, of course, as, as soon as he does this, the defense objects, and the judge sends the jury to the, I, I believe the judge then sent the jury uh, to the sequester room. But at any rate, they did preliminary questioning so that the justices could decide whether or not to admit the evidence. And Knowlton kept trying to bring, uh, Lizzie claimed she was going to, well, or the woman in the drugstore, if you believe that's Lizzie, uh, was asked, was, said she wanted to buy the prussic acid to clean a sealskin cape, and two people in the store heard her say that. I might add, as an aside, Knowlton had on his witness list two New Bedford pharmacists. Lizzie had been in New Bedford a week or so before the, the murders, and he had two New Bedford pharmacists he was going to call, which one, one would have to assume were going to testify that she tried to buy prussic acid or something like it. But I can't remember who Knowlton had on the stand. It might have been ben, Bent's. Again, these are preliminary questions that, before the jury's going to hear them. Knowlton said, in order to make my case as to why this should be presented, I'm going to bring up some witnesses. So he brings up some furriers to testify, or at least one furrier. And he asked the furrier, can you tell me if prussic acid could be used to clean a, a, a sealskin cape? And the defense objected. And they said, well, he can't testify to that unless he's, unless he's tried it on a sealskin cape, a deadly poison. And so Knowlton says, well, have you ever tried it on a sealskin cape? He says, of course not. Judge said, step down. You're not an expert. They brought up um, Dolan, Dr. Dolan, who was the medical examiner, as to the poisonous aspects of prussic acid for use on sealskin cape. And he was considered not to be an expert in poisons, as I recall, or something like that. Anything that Knowlton brought up, the justices would not allow it. And it, it generally became that the, the bottom line was you can't be an expert on something that doesn't exist. For example, there is no expert on cleaning sealskin capes with prussic acid. <laughs> Because, or, or gasoline, I suppose, or, you know, or, or the atomic bomb. Uh, you don't do that. So. What is prussic acid? Uh, cyanide. There was a prussic acid uh, factory in Fall River. Did you know that? I don't. I imagine they had high worker turnover. Doc, no, Dr. <laughs> Durfee's mill down, okay. down, on, uh, down in the North End had uh, actually manufactured prussic acid locally. Um, but it was used for industrial purposes. Cleaning metal. It has uses, as I understand it, but I, I and I know it's used I'll in a different form. I'll say it again, form. cleaning metal. Right. So maybe she didn't want the prussic acid to kill anybody. She needed the prussic acid to clean metal. Could be. Never know. Yeah. That's, well, why, that's why we don't know the answer to the maybe case. Maybe it would wipe the blood off right. the hatchet. Who knows, right? What's the most un interesting thing or surprising thing you've learned by all of this research that you've done? If there is one thing, I don't know. I'm dismayed by what appears to be at least some of the authors deliberately just making stuff up in a nonfiction book. Now, there may be some of them that I don't agree with that are, well, for example, William Masterton, who wrote, Lizzie didn't do it, exclamation point. Exclamation point's part of the name of the book. I believe that he believes is the case that he makes. I do not believe that he's doing it for sensationalism. I think he really believes it. But some of the other ones, if you read it, you go like, nobody could possibly believe this. Um, the William Borden one being the most obvious. Well, Arnold Brown has got two things that going wrong for it. Uh, one is the illegitimate son, right. which you can't prove. And the second one is the conspiracy, which is so involved and so complicated. And it's you brought up the point that if it was such a secret and nobody talked about it and nobody knew about the conspiracy until Arnold Brown, how did he hear about it? And there's a lot of that in the books that um, Victoria Lincoln thinks she knows the intimate conversations between Lizzie Borden and her father. Uh, she uses quotes in the book. You know, that's one thing that always bothers me in nonfiction books when they use quotes about conversations between people as if they really happened and you heard them. But moreover, she couldn't know that, that conver however the conversation was worded, she can't know if it, if it happened or not. Right. So It's just like when people talk about the relationship between Lizzie and her father. Right. We can't really know what that was about, right? Well, that, that's interesting. And I have an opinion on that, which is 
Uh, there's a lot made about a ring that Lizzie gave her father. I think she was a junior in high school. She, it wasn't a graduation ring like a lot of people said because she never graduated. And he wore it till the day he died. He, and, and, and the day he died, he had the ring on. They go, well, you see, Lizzie couldn't have done it. Her father's got Lizzie's ring on. And, I'm, and my answer is, that doesn't tell you anything about how they feel about each other today. He might have still loved Lizzie, but she might have hated him. You know? Right. So uh, I don't think that necessarily tells, him, tells us anything. Somehow money has a lot to do in this family discord. Oh, absolutely. Money is the root of all evil, especially in the Borden family. It is. If you, you have, you did so much research on the Whitehead house. It was down to the minute of trying to figure out whose money it was, when it happened, how it happened. I mean, you researched auction records, you researched land records you researched land transactions you researched personal accounts trial testimony about it and i think you have the definitive explanation as to what happened with the whitehead head tra whitehead head whitehead land transfer the say that one more say that one more time no 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 don't make me uh <laughs> the whitehead house purchase that so bothered the sisters we'll call them not the girls, because right. they're grown women, that they ceased from attending meals together at, from that point and on. And even the way um, Lizzie addressed Abby. Yes, she was always mother, and now right. all of a sudden she's Mrs. Borden. So the White Hat House, uh, to me, is a completely vanilla event that's blown out of all proportions. Certainly it was by the, the Borden sisters. So the story, as I can glean it, is... Um, when Oliver Gray died, um, he left his house to uh, his wife and one daughter. He had another daughter, but she didn't have part of ownership in the house. Um, so the, it was a two-family house, and his wife lived on one flat, and his daughter, who was by now married. So the, mo the, the, the mother of, of involved is, is um, Jane Gray, and the daughter is Sarah Whitehead and she's married to George Whitehead, they live in another uh, flat of the house. And she is half-sister to Abby And Borden. she's half-sister to Abby. Right. So uh, to have the same father. Her mother's, her father's daughter, but not her right. mother's daughter. Okay. It appears that she, consider, she, Abby, considered Sarah to be um, essentially a sister, uh, not just a half-sister. Uh, and she was very, very young, I think in maybe 25 years old at the time of the murder or something like that. Now, we have to remember that there's no Social Security in those days. Women, most women didn't have a skill or, or, or a marketable skill. They, they might have been housewives, but they didn't have, uh, for example, Alice Russell was a seamstress, but she was single. So she uh, supported herself her whole life that way. But the woman that was a housewife and suddenly her husband dies now has no marketable skill. So we don't know how Jane Grey support herself but at some point about five years before the murders she decided that she wanted to sell her half of the house uh, i've never been able to figure out how the half of the house thing worked but but for whatever reason the whiteheads did not want to sell their half so if, i guess if they had both sold the house it, w it wouldn't have been a problem because the whiteheads wanted to keep it there was a problem was that the whiteheads could not afford to buy out jane gray i don't know how Abby found out about it, but Abby found out about it, and most people say that Andrew Borden bought out the half of the Whitehead house, the Jane Grey half, but land records indicate that Abby Borden was the one that owned, that bought, bought out the half of the house. Now, whether it was all her money or not, I don't know, but it was never in Andrew Borden's name, although the sisters think that Andrew Borden bought it. So, seems like, now, to put it in perspective, when Ed, when Andrew Borden died, he was worth $350,000. The house purchase was 3000 It was nothing compared to his wealth. So at some point, not too long after that, they don't tell the sisters, and why should they? At some point after that, someone the sisters know tell the sisters that this transaction has taken place. And for reasons that make no sense at all, the sisters are livid about this because Andrew Borden, their blood relative, gave money to a non-blood relative. Abby's uh, relationship. Now, keep in mind, Abby Borden and, and Andrew Borden got married, I believe it was 1865. So they've been married almost 30 years at this point. She was married to Andrew far longer. Far longer than the than first his wife. his first wife, right. right. 
So it isn't like she was a gold digger. <laughs> or, or she was. She dug the gold during the Civil War. So, uh, uh, and Andrew wasn't as wealthy in 1865 as he was later. So, the two girls are livid and... Are they livid because he spent the money or livid because he didn't tell them? They claim both. And I've never figured out why it was their business. I know. And then other two grown women. I don't understand why it was their business. Especially since they each had their own... Uh, income from right. him. He gave them allowances. He right. bought them clothes, two wardrobes a year, had handmade clothing made for them. He uh, sent Lizzie on the grand tour for 19 weeks and paid for it. He sent Emma to Wheaton College for a year and a half room and board. Uh, so she got college education, part of a college education. Um, he put running water in the house. He Steam heat. Steam heat. He had a flush privy in the in the cellar, um, he wasn't ungenerous to his family. Not at all. So to have him, oh, and he bought the family a farm uh, over the river right. so that they could go someplace cooler in the summer. He was a man of business. He owned buildings and had tenants. But he doesn't seem particularly stingy no. to his own family. And he lived in a modest house on a busy street. But it was near his businesses. Right. And beyond that, there's no evidence one way or the other, but I, and I would ask you this. There is no example of him spending money on himself. No. It isn't like, oh, well, I, okay, I put the steam heat in, but I've got a brand new four horse carriage. He didn't seem to buy, to buy anything for himself. I ran across newspaper articles that showed he would host annual clam boils in, on his proper Swansea. Was early, it for the neighbors, early, or? early, early. Uh, no, for an organization that oh, he belonged to, okay. um, a social organization that he belonged to, um, or a church organization, and it hosted by Andrew J. Borden. You know, and he was uh, talking about to John Morse, wasn't he, about possibly giving money to an old, old folks, uh, old, home. old ladies' home, old ladies' it, yeah. home. So it wasn't that he was giving his money away. It was that he got to that age, like Bill Gates, where he's like, I can't use all this money. I've got more money than my daughters need. They don't need a ton of money um, to live comfortably. Um, I'm, so he began being generous. And the generosity was not outrageous, though. Right. Well, the thing that, that I could never come to grips with is you've got a 65-year-old man and a wife not too much younger. You've got two, well, one middle-aged daughter, one approaching middle age. The buying of the Whitehead house is not something that, that the parents would have any reason to tell the daughters about. I know. It's it none of no, their business. It has nothing to do with them. No, it's none of their business. Right. But it's not even... It's Unless not, they're, like, really hung up on the fact that it's their inheritance that he spent. And, 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 and he knows that. And maybe he knows that. So they confront him and how it how it came to pass is not uh, not obvious but he caves into them and he gives them his father's old homestead uh which is worth five thousand dollars and so which is more than obviously the, than he gave for the well even if he gave the money it's more than he gave for the uh, the jane gray part of the of the uh, fourth street property and the girls get the it's a two-family house and the girls get girls the daughters get the income from the two flats and they can't handle it so they do keep the house for five years and eventually they go to him and say, we don't want the house anymore. And then he, I, I take it back. They didn't give, he gave them the property. He didn't give them any money at the time, but they were getting the rents. And then after the, after five years, he actually gave them $5,000 for the house. And that was just like the month before the murders. Right. So each of them had $2,500 right. in the bank. Right. They were not. One well, thing. Lizzie had to give her uh, financial um, condition at the trial. It was several thousand dollars she had. They're not broke. No. They have everything they need. And and by the way, have not done one thing. That's the thing. Not done one thing to get one of those dollars. And they have never worked a day in their lives. Never. Right. And they never did. No. Nope. Their whole lives. Well, they did do some. I don't know about Emma, but they did. They did volunteer work. Lizzie did some volunteer work. I'm not right. saying that. Right. I'm saying they never had to earn a living. Right. They only had to earn money on investments right? <laughs> and property investments. And they did have investments. She had some stocks from uh, mills. Right. I don't know. I would assume Andrew 
bought them for her or told her which ones to buy. I don't know that, but I'm assuming that's what Or they were gifts from right, right. the estate of her grandfather right. when he died right, like in 1886, something like that. Right. So these were two lucky ladies when it comes right down to the finances. Well, they were living like an upper class woman would. Yeah. Where, where the father doesn't expect his daughters, uh, that if they don't get married, he doesn't expect them to go to work. Now, here's the argument. What do you think about people who say that Andrew wouldn't let his daughters come out? He wouldn't show them. He wouldn't let them get married. He wouldn't, you know, uh, throw them the, the coming out party that other girls would get. So they were never socially presented. And because they were never socially presented, they couldn't find husbands. And it's his fault. I Well, it depends how you define that. You, if you use that argument, they might not have found one of the Durfies to marry. doesn't mean they couldn't find anybody to marry. Exactly. And, and but, but they don't want another George Whitehead. They want... Or a Hiram Harrington. Right. They want somebody that's going to keep treating them better even than they've been treated so far. And since neither sister married, there's no offspring. So there's no direct descendants. Right. So it all dies with them. And they all leave their money to charity right. and friends. Right. So what's it all about, Alfie? Yeah. So we don't, you know, if Lizzie did do, if the thing, the other thing that's interesting is if Lizzie did, let, let's say that Lizzie was going to poison her parents, her mother and stepfather. Um, Without poisoning Bridget at the same time. Well, oh, take a step back. Poison's indiscriminate because if she's going to poison them, it's probably going to be in the food. Remember now, Emma has managed to leave the house for an extended period of time. So now she doesn't have to worry about Emma anymore getting poisoned. True. I don't think she cared if Bridget died. I'm not saying she wanted Bridget to die, but I, I, I think if you went to her and said, well, okay, we can, there's a way to do this and kill your Andrew and Abby, but you know, Bridget will die too. Oh, okay. That's what I think. But if she's the only one not dead and everybody else is dead in the house, I mean, that's a yeah, big problem. Yeah, does she think it through? That's a big problem. Well, and what if... Andrew dies and Abby doesn't. I know. Now Abby, well, in those days, this is very arcane. Uh, this is very antiquated. <laughs> I did a lot of research on this for the first book, and I couldn't believe it. If, a, if a, you have a man and a woman, if, if the woman, uh, I'm married. If, in Massachusetts If, if law. the woman dies, yep. the man, let's say, let's say the woman came into the marriage with $100,000, well, $10,000, and the man had, came into the marriage with $10,000. The man would get all twenty thousand dollars when she dies. When she dies, right? If the woman, if the man dies first, and there are children, the woman only gets a percentage, a third. A, at the, well, it's a, it's a sliding scale, yeah, and it changes by age. Um, so it I, matters who right. was killed first, right? So Abby's killed; her money goes to Andrew immediately, right? And and, and of course, her money doesn't really make any difference. The point is that she's out of the picture. Right. So now when Andrew dies, assuming he doesn't get married again, and he's 70, so he, well, well, may not, the two daughters will get all the money. Right. Because there's no other children. Right. But, but Lizzie also didn't necessarily think through that this could go wrong in a lot of ways. Not only, you know, it's like, and I could be thrown in jail. Um, if, if I'm convicted, I'm not going to get the money anyway. It, it seems like none of that, for a non-criminal, it seems like she assumed a lot of things, which actually in the end worked out for her. That's the thing about this right. case. It's so weird. Like everything was working in somebody's favor for no one to go. Everything. Yes. Everything. Not, Every not nine out of 10. Everything. Everything. Right. So whatever that means, they, the police thought it was her. So they stopped looking right. after the trial. They gave all the exhibits to her lawyer and said, No, the police did not stop looking after the trial. There are witness statements um, of, of uh, the police going, looking at other possible suspects after Lizzie Borden um, is, is indicted, after she's arrested. After she's arrested. Yes. But not after she's acquitted. Oh, no. The, by that point, it was either Lizzie Borden did it or, uh, or you know, if she didn't do it, we don't have a case anyway. So That was it. Right. So... So the police were convinced. All right. The state was convinced. And yet justice says, like OJ, you're not guilty. Right. Well, keep in mind, a trial is a legal proceeding, not a scientific finding. <laughs> Tell me that again. 
Say that again so everybody hears that. A, a trial is a legal proceeding. It doesn't prove you're guilty or not guilty. You're found guilty or not guilty. Right. It's whether the prosecution proved its right. case or against didn't. you. Or didn't. Right. 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 So I've read a lot about the O.G. Simpson case. It's clear to me he killed his, his wife and Ron Goldman, but the law didn't find it. The, the, the courts didn't find it. So. No, the jury didn't right. find it, too. No. Do you think, on a weird, really weird side note, Bruno Hauptmann was guilty? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, it, it, a lot of well, unlike unlike the, the Borden case, Bruno, the, the Lindbergh baby case had a lot of evidence, and um, there there is a sidebar in this if you want me to talk about it. But the Lindbergh baby was was uh, taken out of out of a bedroom, second floor bedroom in Hopewell, New Jersey, and the and the Lind, the Lindbergh house was isolated. He had just built it, and if there's an aerial photograph of it, there is nothing around it, nothing. No neighbors, no nothing. There's just some clearing in a field. Well, the house is huge, but there's nothing else around it. I don't know how the person knew where the Limbug baby was, but he used a ladder to climb up to the, uh, to the second floor window. Uh, the ladder was homemade. Hauptman was a carpenter. The ladder was homemade, and... The baby was taken, it's a long story, but the baby was taken, taken down the ladder, and halfway down the ladder, the person that took the baby fell. The ladder broke. The ladder broke in half, and the, the culprit and the baby fell to the ground. The baby was eventually found in the woods a few months later. Where the question comes in is, I'm confident Bruno Hauptmann was sending the ransom letters, but anybody could send the ransom letters. Is it, did Bruno Hauptman necessarily, was he the person that kidnapped the baby? Now, there was a, a forensic expert that went to the roof of the garage, the second floor of the garage, pulled into the board and loft, and found boards missing in the loft, which he sweared on a trial by nail hole investigation, matched, he did this remnant of the ladder that they had that broke, matched the, the the nail hole pattern of the boards that were removed. Didn't they find money in his? So that 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 worked against Hauptman. But um, uh, Lindbergh, against um, advice, did pay ransom, but all the bills were marked, and they weren't passed, or at least they weren't found for quite a while. And then suddenly these bills started to appear, and there was a reward, of course, and so on. Any number of bills were found, but nobody could remember who gave them the money. So um, I believe the bills were, were found for about a year and um, service station attendants were asked when they got a large bill to write down the license plate number, the, the bills that were, the ransom bills were large. What, if you got a large bill, write down the license plate number of the car that got the gas. And almost nobody did it, but this one guy did it. And it was one of the bills, and he knew that Hauptman bought the gas. They went to his garage, and they found two cans of money in Hauptman's garage. Hauptman said, Hauptman's story was... He was saving it for somebody. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I know a, a friend of mine uh, gave me the money. He went back to Germany. Right. Hauptman's from Germany. He went back to Germany to see his family, and he died. So I don't know what to do with the money, but that's why I've got it. Right. So that was a story and nobody believed it. That with the, the attic lumber uh, testimony did him in. Uh, but I do believe there's enough evidence to prove that he wrote them a ransom notes. I don't know that he can at the baby, but I, I do believe he wrote them a ransom notes. So what are you going to work on that? In late May of 1893, a Fall River woman named Bertha Manchester was killed with an ax. And the reason it, it got in the newspapers, well, it would have gotten the newspapers anyway, but the reason it made a bigger splash was because it was right before the Borden trial started. And of course, a lot of people didn't think Lizzie Borden committed the murders. And so now they're saying, oh, the axe murder is still out there. Um, so I, I did, I, I'm writing a book about that murder. Uh, a person was, was eventually, or eventually confessed on that murder though. It had nothing to do with the Borden murders. So what's your angle on this book? A uh, couple of angles. One was um, how the murder was investigated because it's interesting. The Azorians had a lot of workers here that came over and, and a lot of them became farm workers. And this one particular Azorian worked uh, briefly for Man Stephen Manchester, Bertha Manchester's father who had a dairy farm. 
I wanted to see how that was investigated versus the very rich Lizzie Borden. And it was oh, interesting, interesting because... Yeah. Immigrant. Uh, yeah. yeah, here's a poor immigrant that, that was eventually arrested. And how he was treated compared to Lizzie Borden, there was no comparison. Thrown in jail, not given any chance for bail, nothing. Um, exactly the opposite. Uh, uh, thought was guilty from the start. Uh, so that was interesting. Then how they proved the case... Um, it didn't go to trial. They, they they had so much evidence against him that um, that he confessed. The other angle on the case was that what they called the Portuguese community was very tight knit, and it didn't seem to matter to the Portuguese whether he was guilty. Well, I mean, they hoped he wasn't guilty, but even if he was guilty, they were going to support him. And they even called in the counsel from Boston to help him to help find a lawyer and so on. And um, they kept fighting for him. He was, he, he um, forgot how many, I think he was sentenced to 40 years. He was only 20 years old. Uh, he was sent to the prison in uh, Boston, state prison in Boston, which was a hellhole. He lasted 20 years, or roughly more than about 25 years. Some of the descendants of the Portuguese who were trying to get him, trying to help him in 1893, like the sons, still were trying to get him out and they were able to, to, talk to the governor into giving him a pardon so long as he moved back to the Azores, which he did. So it's quite a fascinating case. You tracked him back into Azores at all? Yes. Um, oh, so they, uh, well, you don't have to tell us now because I don't want you to give away the book, but that's what, what yes. Yeah. There's, there's ample evidence to return. The, now what happened after that? I don't know, but there is ample evidence to return to the Azores. That's interesting. Yeah. Oh, wow. When was that going to be started to be worked on? Um, so almost, I mean, uh, almost ready published. Well, probably this year sometime. That's exciting. Yeah, right. So, you know, one time my sister and I went to visit Oak Grove Cemetery and we went up to Tommy, who was the, um, he was the parks man at the Oak Grove Cemetery. He was in charge. And he said, let me guess, you want to see Lizzie Borden? And we're like, no, we want to know where Bertha Manchester's buried. And he's like, oh, Bertha, nobody asks about Bertha. I'm so glad you asked me. I'll take you there myself. He was just so, he felt like she got overshadowed by the Lizzie Borden case, you know, and Oak Grove has those uh, markings on the ground, so it takes you right to the cemetery right. plot where the family is. Um, but there are two other very famous murder victims in that cemetery. Um, there's Bertha Manchester and there's, Sarah Cornell. Oh, okay. So Sarah Cornell <laughs> is also buried there. She was originally killed in, I believe, 1833 on Durfee Farm, which is now Kennedy Park. And her remains were removed to Oak Grove Cemetery at a later date. Her headstone's in awful condition, but she's buried there. So you have these three women. Uh, Lizzie's not a victim. Right. But these other murder well, but victims the parents were there. Were. Yeah, but the parents were. So you have um, quite a bit of uh, macabre history well, there, going there's on a, there. there. Also, an, inter an interesting aside arose from this. And again, I'm speculating. But remember I mentioned that Edwin Porter missed a lot of the trial. Right. Well, guess what happened just before the trial started? Bertha Manchester was killed in Fall River. And that had almost as many column inches when it happened as the Borden murders did for a while. Okay. Well, they had to have a crime reporter covering that. All right. So I'm guessing that Edwin Porter was pulled off the Borden case in order to uh, report on the on the Manchester case. That makes sense. Right. That makes total sense. So his holes are f empty because em in the trial. Right. Because he's off discovering, right. but he doesn't write a book about Bertha. Nobody does. No, nobody. Nobody cared about Bertha. I was the first one, I guess, to care about Bertha because well, I didn't think she was getting her due. No, right. never right. has she gotten her due. Right. The police department didn't care much about her either. Right. Do you go into the relationship she had with her father, Stephen, or his odd character? Well, the problem that you have with this book is Lizzie Borden has been an item since July 4th, 1892, and Bertha July, Manchester... August 4th, 1892. August 4th, uh, uh, 1892, and Bertha Manchester was a country, 20-year-old country girl. Um, nobody cared about her. But it was a horror. Way right, but, but but you can't do research on a twenty-year-old country girl. There is no there is no information on a twenty-year-old country girl. Right. 
So it's a, this book was hard to write in that sense, and I did have to rely on newspaper accounts. However, it's interesting because by all accounts, whether they learned something uh, or changed their tune because it was a poor victim, the newspaper accounts then seemed quite believable. They, they, they didn't seem, to, they, they agreed with each other. There didn't seem to be any um, crazy writing or anything like that. So, but that's all I had to, uh, there, so what happened was there was a preliminary hearing. So there's, there's no inquest testimony that's available. There was a preliminary hearing right around the time of the board, end of the board of murders, I believe. And um, Stephen uh, Manchester was the first witness. And he stepped, he, he, I think he, I believe he testified for about an hour. He gets off the stand and they bring Dr. Dolan up, who's still the medical examiner, and he's going to report on what he found. They ask him two questions, two or three questions, and the defense stood up and said, we would like to discontinue this hearing. Essentially, they threw in the towel because they knew that the evidence was going to be too much against their, their client. That's, and that I read in the newspaper. I, I've never, I, I, I'm, I'm assuming that the transcript in the newspaper is correct. Um, that's, that's the only legal document or background I have oh, in the wow. case. Right. So the rest I got to sort of fill in with other so things. So there's no trial? There's just so, no, because he, he confessed. So. Interesting. Well, I can't wait to read about Bertha. So I am very much looking forward to that one, like all your other books. They're thoroughly researched. They're interesting to read. They're keepers. They're very important works. So I want to thank you so very much for agreeing to be interviewed about your books and to talk about it at such scholarship level that you have, I don't know, you've learned it from scratch and it's a mountain of information that is in your head. So I'm amazed. Well, I thank you for that. And keep in mind, I couldn't have done this without all the trial uh, transcripts and preliminary hearing and all that that you did. I mean, Without that, it's just another opinion. So we yeah, have well, I just provide yeah. my right. my father taught us that if we're going to discuss something, we need to all be on the same page. So he read Sullivan's book, asked us at dinner, "What do you think about Lizzie Borden?" And I'm living in Florida, raised in Florida, saying, "Who's that?" Right. And he said, "Uh, we're going to talk about this because I have an opinion." And he made us all read the book. So when we were all done reading the book and passing it around, then we sat down and we would eat dinner and we would talk about Lizzie Borden, whether she was guilty or innocent. And I'm 11 years old, you know, 12 years old. So I got hooked by Goodbye Lizzie Borden. And then after that, it was, we're going to solve the crime. We're going to be the ones to solve the crime. Well, you would have put me out of business. Well, it's funny how you everybody <laughs> approaches it that way. Like They get hooked because they go, I'm going to be the one. I'm going to find the evidence. I'm going to be the one. And it's a really, it's an uphill climb. How did you do? I gave up. <laughs> After 25 years, I gave up. I'm like, it doesn't matter anymore. Because what's more interesting to me now is Fall River history and women in the Victorian era and newspaper journalism and yellow journalism and everything around this well, and city politics right. at the time and, and, that, and the police department. So the Lizzie Borden case, as an outsider, the Lizzie Borden case to some extent puts Fall River on the map, but... By the same token, it overshadows all the other, the, the, all the, the milling industry, all that. There's lots of good stories there, I'm sure, that right. you don't hear about because everybody wants to know about Lizzie Borden. Well, the mills aren't there anymore. Right. So what's... Neither's Lizzie. But the house is. <laughs> right, yeah. And her other house is. Right. And her grave is. So why not bank on that, Fall River? You know, why not right. bring in some tourist dollars that way? Um, murder tourist dollars are... Oh, yeah. Big time business. Yeah, the worst thing that could happen to, to Fall River in this case would be that the case is solved. Because, <laughs> I agree with you. Right, because everybody comes, they want to solve the case or they've got an opinion or they want to see where it happened, whatever it would be. Well, I always used to say you can't know the case until you yeah. stay in the oh, house. By the way, I, yeah. another thing I've said is if Lizzie Borden, if we find a note that Lizzie Borden wrote on her deathbed and said, okay, I fess up, I did kill my father and stepmother, it still doesn't solve the case because we can't figure out how she was able to, to do it. 
I know. She is an ordinary That's, person. There's two halves yeah. of it. Most murder cases, we yeah. know how it was done. This one, we can't figure out how it was done. No, you I can't. Mean, we, know, we know they were, they, somebody used a hatchet, but we don't know how they did all these, how they cover up so many things. Right. Right. And the time difference between the two murders. Right. And how this is possible. And where did they hide? And what did they do in between? And why? So much of it is a mystery. And because it's a mystery, it'll endure. So it will. Are you going to write any more books about Lizzie? I don't know. I have to think about it. I've certainly <laughs> got enough research on it. I probably have something else. Actually, I did. I did start to keep a record of some. Like for example, there was a thing called the what was it? Tricky. Um, Tricky McHenry. Tricky McHenry uh, affair, which was some. Uh, shenanigans between a private detective and a newspaper a writer about the uh, about the board murders and I'm from Buffalo originally and after yes after the uh, murders um, McHenry moved to Buffalo yeah and he had and a detective agency. so I actually went to the um, historical society in Buffalo to see if they had anything on McHenry but he was uh, I found some interesting things about him that he, he was Quite a character, but not in a good way. No, not in a good not way. Not in a good way. I so. think he was arrested right. for impersonating a Secret Service right. officer. Ah, uh, he was actually convicted of yeah. that and put uh -huh. in jail, I believe. Uh -huh. Oh, he was put in jail. He was given a sentence, and I could never find him after that. And I couldn't. I can't figure out why I can't find him after I that. I think, honestly, yeah, I don't think that's his real name. He doesn't exist right. in any genealogical record. Right. I don't think that's his real name. I don't think so either. And also. He had a son. Yes. With one of his wives. With Nellie. Uh, well, he got married again. Yeah. Um, he, he divorced her and he got married again. Um, it was either it was either the daughter or somebody from the second marriage. And during the divorce procedure, that child was not called McHenry. It was McHenry's middle name. I forgot what his middle name was, but that's the name that they gave that the child used as his as his surname mm. so i'm wondering if that was his uh his real surname but i agree with you there is not i've not found one record of any type any type on on, on uh McHenry. yeah not a birth certificate not no a nothing. Census not report, a census nothing. report nothing. nothing nothing at all right and the same goes with his wife nelly although she's in newspapers and has some newspaper reports where she sues him for divorce right um, so there's stories about her, but um, she figures into the Borden case somewhat where she went in and pretended that she was a friend and interviewed Bridget Sullivan. She went into Bridget and said yeah. she was, uh, what did she say? She was part of the defense team or something, she said. She lied. Yeah, right. And had this big, long interview with Bridget right. that was printed in the newspaper. But um, though Bridget never denied it, there was too much weird kind of slimy things going on back then with those two that I began to think that maybe that most of that was fictional. I mean, she describes the room though. Thank God she was there. She describes the interior of the house. She describes the rooms. She describes what she sees. So she has an eye for detail, but I don't know how true it is. I don't know if I could trust it. Like the interview that Lizzie supposedly gave, which she didn't give later on, right. never happened. She never talked to anybody. You've had a couple of audiences now listen to you talk. And what kinds of questions surprised you the most that you got from your audiences? Well, the, the audience, I, I can't speak to the people who didn't say anything, but the ones that asked questions all had some background on the Borden case. And I don't know if they were asking me questions to confirm what they thought or if they really didn't know the answer but a lot of them had already made up their mind on the case one way or the other no matter what i said so yeah i kind of thought that too but that's okay yeah as the one woman kept saying over and over again it's an opinion i'm entitled to my opinion mm, <laughs> it's a but it's a murder case you right know, it's, it's not an it's opinion not, it's not as that color pretty you know no no right. it's not do you like that yeah. piece of art on the right wall? yeah <laughs> <laughs> no it's the guilt or innocence of a right. human being right well and you want, if she ever gets on a murder trial jury, you want her to have more than an opinion. You want her to be able to look at the facts of the case. Yeah. You know? Right, right, right. Well, she was stuck on uh, Arnold Brown. Now, the thing with Arnold Brown is that he's, it's ex an accessible read. So it's easy to read. It's interesting to read. It's a believable read. 
And then you put it down and you think about it and you go, nah, yeah. not possible. Conspiracies never work. Um, the Lincoln conspiracy fell apart, you know, within a day. Right, so. right. Because conspiracies never stay quiet. Right. Yeah. Well, I have no conspiracy here, so I'm here to thank you very much again, and um, I look forward to reading your new Birth of Manchester book and working on it with you and making it another reason for you to come to Fall River. Okay, I was good talking to you. Do a book sign on that one too. Okay. Now that we're sort of semi safe from right. we hope from uh, the deadly COVID. So thank you, Bill. Okay. Thank you so Thanks, very Stephanie. much. Thank you for listening to the Lizzie Borden Podcast, Episode 16. We've been talking to William Spencer, author of two books on the Borden case, The Case Against Lizzie Borden and Lizzie Borden Uncut, A Case Book of Theories. Both are available at the Fall River Historical Society, where they have signed copies, and on Amazon.com. Find Richard Barron's Lizzie Borden Girl Detective Stories at Amazon.com and at lizzieboardandgirldetective.com, where you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Listen to more Lizzie Borden podcasts on our website or on Podbean, Audible, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, and YouTube.